Today, let's talk about Lo Cha. I'm gonna go through his kit, the mechanics of each of these skills, any gimmicks or interactions, how they can be used, what exactly they mean for us. And then we'll also talk about stat priorities and then finally team comps and where he fits into the meta. Oh, and rotations, which is probably the most important part. If you watch nothing else from this video, then at least watch the part about rotations. My guys, remember when I talk about the meta, I'm talking strictly from a memory of chaos point of view. Outside of MOC, the meta does not matter. Hi, I'm Lace, and as always, waifu over meta. But with that, let's begin. Okay, Mocha, imaginary type. That already brings us to the first question. Does him being a rare element type affect whether you should roll for him or not? Generally, the thing about elements is that the place that it matters the most is whether they're gonna be contributing to the abusing of weaknesses or not. Healers or abundance characters like Lota usually are skill point generators, which means that they're gonna basic a lot. So at this point, it's a bit of a yes, but we'll go a little bit deeper into it a little bit later. That's what she said. Also, we'll be getting Yukong in 1.2, so don't feel too much FOMO about it. All right, so second of all, Abundance Path, aka Healer. However, where our existing healers like Bailu and Natasha were HP scaling, Locha, on the other hand, is actually attack scaling if you click on literally any of these skills. And this means that he's going to comparatively do more damage than the other healers, but he is significantly squishier. In late game MOC, when we can start trading off survivability for offense, I think he will be worth it because every bit of damage counts. For everyday use outside of MOC, I'm sure you have nothing to worry about. All right, let's get into the skills, and he's got actually a pretty exciting kit. The basic attack does imaginary damage. Simple, but later on, there will be a trace that allows your basic attack to actually have more value than simply just damage and breaking. Kind of like Silver Wolf, but instead of debuffs, it kind of becomes like an AoE heal. Conditional though, so you gotta keep that in mind. His skill, on the other hand, is a single target on-demand direct heal. However, there is also actually a passive component where if any of your allies drop below 50% HP, he will actually Actually automatically use this skill without consuming any skill points but it does have a two turn cooldown as you can see from here I don't think it's going to be a problem because there is going to be more healing in his kit and then on the ascension 2 his skill this one over here it gets a cleanse as you can see and this is really nice because CC is like the one thing that can truly stop us in any content but the last part of this skill is that it gives us one stack of abyss flower which we will talk about more in a second for the ultimate it's a straightforward AoE imaginary damage to all enemies and it strips them all of one buff. On top of that, he also gets another stack of Abyss Flower. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're seeing damage and you're thinking, DPS Lotta? Maybe, kind of, maybe like sub DPS at best, kind of like Silver Wolf. But with a ratio like that, probably not what I would be focusing on from the beginning. However, from a breaking standpoint, it only hits once, but it is AOE, so it is all right. It does 60 toughness break, or what some people refer to as two breakness units. And don't forget that breaking with imaginary units is pretty freaking strong. And so at this point, the biggest thing about Lo Cha is that he doesn't offer an oh shit, need a heal button. Like when you're about to get your ass cheeks majorly clapped, you can't do anything about it. There is no hit like three or four for your Bailu or your Natasha. And so all that means is that you've just got to play a little bit more controlled, smarter, and planned out. Okay, let's start talking about Abyss Flower. When we get two stacks of Abyss Flower, so like using your skill as well as your ultimate, he will consume both stacks of those Abyss Flowers and then lay down a field. Now, whilst the field is up, if anybody from your team attacks the enemy in the field, then that character will heal themselves, Lochai included. However, at A4, that heal goes from single target to AOE, meaning that it heals not only the attacker, but also all of the teammates. It is a little bit lower because typically splash effects are slightly weaker just to balance sake, but there are certainly ways to abuse this. And this is what I meant by Lochar's basic attack, having utility despite just being a basic attack. And so in terms of how to really abuse this field, the most obvious answer that I'm pretty sure every content creator has covered is Clara. Every time Clara counters, she triggers the effect. And so extending on Clara, the characters that would have the most synergy would be characters that get to attack a lot. So I'm talking like your Zilla, I'm talking your March 7th with the double counter, your Herta, Himeko, Sushang because of extra turn. I'm not saying that you have to use Lodge Heart with these characters, but it's a characteristic that you should look for in terms of synergies to really abuse it. However, on the flip side, characters that are more enmity based, like Arlen, lower HP gives you more attack or damage, for example. These ones are unfortunately going to have anti-synergy 
because if he's getting healed and he's getting healed by something you can't control, then he's going to be doing less damage. And so coming back to the field, it lasts two turns. And to be specific, it's two of Lorcha's turns. And so in that case, maybe we should build him speedless so that it actually makes the field last longer. Mm, I probably wouldn't. And the reason is because the more speed he has, the more A, skill points that he's actually going to generate, but also B, get through his own rotation faster, which we'll talk about in a second. As with all healers, we want to use skill points as little as possible, only when necessary. And so because the only other way to trigger the field is to stack abyss flowers with the ultimate over here, it therefore becomes extremely important to hit the energy breakpoints for optimal rotation. Another thing to note about the field is that whilst it is up, you cannot stack new abyss flowers. So what this means is that the quote unquote optimal gameplay is when the field is down, you would use two basics. And only when the two turns have passed, and it's two turns because it lasts two turns, you would then use your skill and your ultimate. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the rotation section, but the final thing I want to say about this is that it is the only on-demand heal that Lorcha has, so if you need to use it, you need to use it. And speaking of inoptimal but practical gameplay, there may be times where you want to use the ultimate for its buff stripping capability as opposed to it just being an abyss flower charger. Right now, I guess you can really leave it up to the circumstance that you're in because I don't think it's like that worth. And the reason I think that is because all of the high threat buffs are actually not removable. What that then means is that its utility would be more like removing attack buffs when you know an AoE is coming to make sure that your team takes less damage so that you have to heal less or potentially even removing enemy defense buffs to deal more damage, maybe even getting a killing blow. Just remember that the option is there. And so in terms of skills, the last thing to mention is that at A6, he gets a Giga Juicer to his CC resist by 70%. That is freaking insane. In terms of stat priority, I think it's pretty clear. Outgoing healing boost first, then attack, which is equal to speed, and then potentially defensive stats. The rationale behind the defensive stats is because I see your Tingyuns and I see them getting their asses clapped all the time. And so for Relics, it's pretty straightforward, pretty similar to your other healers builds, or Natasha's at least. It's gonna be four Musketeer, giving you attack as well as the speed and basic attack damage boost, or it's gonna be two Musketeer for the attack and two of the healer set for the outgoing healing. I think by now, most people have realized that the four piece healer set this one over here is kind of ass. Why are you bullying me? But if you do find a way to somehow make it like extremely high value, then go for it. But for my recommendation, I'm personally gonna go for Musketeer for sure. For boots, you can choose attack or speed. I would probably choose speed. I'm not wearing them because I literally don't have any. Body is straightforward. It's gonna be outgoing healing boost. And as for the trinkets, it's definitely going to be either fleet, which is this one I have on, increases the wearer's max HP by 12%. And if you reach the speed threshold, then everybody gets extra attack. Or it's gonna be the other extreme extremely good set, Space Ceiling Station, where it just gives you attack and then more attack after the speed threshold. Personally, I'm gonna stick with Fleet because I do like team-wide bonuses, like everyone gets 8% attack, but I don't think you can go wrong with either of them. There is one more option and that is gonna be Von Wack, but again, we will talk about that in the rotation section. You see how important it is now? For ropes, again, you really have two choices, energy regenerate or attack. And then lastly, for the Orbeez, I know I have HP equipped, that's because I stripped down my Natasha for my Lorcha, but this guy is most probably gonna be attack. Light cones, signature light cone, I'm not gonna talk about it because it is always gonna be the best in slot for the character it was made for. The next one is gonna be post-op, and this light cone is really good, except for the fact that we don't heal on our ultimate, which is pretty much half of the effect. However, with the energy regenerate, what you could do is actually use it instead to get your ults over the line for the energy thresholds. Personally though, I wouldn't do it. I would rather run this on like my Bailu or my Natasha. It's just such a good light cone to sacrifice for only one team. And so next we've got shared feeling. Now, this one is really interesting because not only does it give you outgoing healing, but it also gives you two energy when you're using your skill. Now, when you think back to Lorcha's skill, there's an automatic passive component. Unfortunately, I don't think that actually triggers this two energy regen. However, this may actually be the light cone that gets you a little bit across the line to hit that optimal rotation. Perfect timing is also really nice because it gives your effect resistance. Combining it with the super high effect resistance that he has from his A6 talent, this guy is actually gonna be unstoppable. And you kind of want that for a healer. However, be warned that his natural 70% effect resist kind of skill thing, it actually doesn't contribute to the scaling here. And the TLDR of the scaling is that a third of your effect resistance gets converted to outgoing healing with a cap. Again, that 70% does not convert. Quid pro quo. 
I'm 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 both a fan and not a fan of it. I think the randomness is really fun, but I'm not gonna recommend it as something that's solid. It's kind of just fun and that's it. And battles are so turbulent, it's quite hard to plan around it. So if you do end up using this one, I would recommend just treating it more as like a bonus. I don't think cornucopia nor fine fruit are really worth talking about, but then you have multiplication, which is incredibly jacked for a three-star light cone. After the wearer uses their basic attack, which we will be doing quite often with Lorcha, their next action will be advanced forward by 20%. I don't think I need to emphasize how good that is, but the downside of this is that you do give up about like 200 or 300 attack in terms of raw stats. And the thing about the light cones and the base stats is that they are added together before they go into the equation. So losing 200 or 300 attack from here is actually pretty massive. And then as for these last two, time waits for no one and the warmth one, they both increase max HP. They are good. We've got the outgoing healing, but again, if possible, I would probably prefer to use both of these on the other healer when you go into MOC, Natasha or Bailu. Now, with all of that context in mind, let's start talking about rotations. And so knowing that the energy cost of his ultimate is at 100, we can do a couple of calculations and simulations as to how exactly can we get his ultimate and therefore how exactly do we play him because his playstyle is very dependent on his ultimate generating the abyss flowers. And so what I've got here is comparing different action combinations against energy values because there aren't actually that many sources of energy regenerate. The ones that are highlighted in green are the ones that are valid above 100 cost. And so for example, within four turns, if you use two skills and two basics, QQEE -E or EEQQ, -E or some kind of combination of that, you would then be able to get off your ultimate as a naked man without any other ER stuff. And so you can see that I went ahead and simulated what exactly this would look like in battle. We would basic first and then use our skill and then use the skill again, that's two abyss flowers, then our field would drop. And then with the field down here, we would basic and then we would fulfill that requirement of EQQE or QEEQ, can't remember which one. And then we would actually get the ultimate here. What we would then do next is use another basic for the field's second turn. And then for the sixth turn, we can use the ultimate first and then use the skill afterwards. So you get the energy from the skill to go towards the next ultimate. And then because we use ultimate into skill, Abyss Flower 1, Abyss Flower 2, we get another field. And then we kind of rinse and repeat. Now, this is really freaking tedious, okay? Out of all of these combinations up here, there is one in particular that really caught my eye, and that's this one over here, EQQQ. So that's one skill for every three basics. And so the simulation is this one over here because this combination gets us to 99.75. 99.75 is actually extremely close to his threshold of 100. And remember shared feeling. That was the light cone that actually gave you a little bit of energy. It gave you two at base every time you use a skill. And so knowing that and coming back to this sheet over here and knowing that it's EQQQ, that means that we can actually count that energy, that two energy to get us over the threshold using this combination here. And so the simulation looks like this over here. Basic, basic skill, getting your first abyss flower. Now, the first two basics, you will be a little bit unprotected. There are really like two ways that can get you over these two turns without dying. And the first is stacking the technique because it's one that you can use, get a buff and switch to another character and then get another buff and you can stack them all and use them all to go into the next round. Or we've also got the automatic component from this guy over here, the skill. And I guess there is a third option over here where you can swap this skill and this basic. But back to it, basic, basic skill, one abyss flower, and then basic again, this with this combination gets us over to ultimate. And so we'll get it and use it both in the same turn. The field will then drop because there's two abyss flowers. And then from there, we can rinse and repeat. Basic, basic, skill, basic. Basic, basic, skill, basic. And so what this means is that there is about a 66% uptime where there is like one dead round. But remember in that round, we are actually using the skill and there is also the auto component. However, the thing is, is that this is a simulation and I don't really like simulations because most of the time they're not practical. So if you don't learn anything else, then at least learn this. When the field is up, use basic attacks. When the field is down, use the skill if you need to. Use the ultimate whenever it's up to charge the abyss flower. And really, that's kind of it. Lastly, team comps. And I hope you also remembered what I said about before, the ones that will get extra turns, etc. Those are probably like your first picks. However, aside from that, 
Anywhere your Bailu goes or your Natasha goes or even your Japard, your Lorcha can also take their place. But it may not be like a 100% replacement, right? Because of his squishiness. Otherwise, the most obvious team comp is the mono light silver wolf comp, which is this one over here, Welt, Lorcha, Yukong, and Silver Wolf. This is currently one of the meta CN comps, this one over here. However, there is another variant of it in which you switch out the Welt for the Zilla instead. And speaking of Zilla, there is one more thing that I did want to mention, and it's the compatibility between Imaginary and Quantum. Because what you will notice is that it's extremely rare, I don't even know if it exists, but it's extremely rare for any monsters or enemies to actually have Quantum and Imaginary weaknesses together. And so in the context of MOC, what you will quickly realize is that one side actually favors one of them. So for example, this one favors Imaginary, and the other one would be more appropriate with the Quantum, because you can see the Gatekeeper over here, the main boss, is quantum. And so what this means from a team building point of view is that it's not really the greatest idea to actually run something like this because you're wanting to build two teams, right? So you would probably rather separate the quantums with the imaginaries. And of course, Silver Wolf is the exception. However, my guys, with that, my voice is gone. This is the end of the video. And if you guys did find it helpful or kind of enjoyable, I don't know, maybe you liked it a little bit, then please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel or turning on that notification bell on. Otherwise, as your boy uh, Wide Yenching again said, all good things must come to an end. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.